Welcome to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about Iran's nuclear progress and what happens when it gets to be a nuclear power. Our guest for this show, this discussion, is Carl Baker, Senior Advisor of Pacific Forum. Welcome to the show, Carl. Good to be back, Jay. Always good to talk to you about the world events. And uh, this one is uh, certainly in, in the news today, yesterday, and probably will be for the foreseeable future. We got you got Russia rattling sabers again, um, and you got Iran uh, uh, building bombs, and so we need to we need to track on these things because they they could have a huge effect on everything in the world. Let's look at the history first. Iran's been working on nuclear bombs for a while, and uh, Barack Obama entered into an agreement that ostensibly. Um, alleviated the risk, at least to some extent. Can you talk about that deal that that Barack Obama made uh, with Iran? So, so let's talk about that agreement with with uh, Iran, J, J, JPCOA, and it is uh, it was it was an agreement that was fraught with with a lot of risk, I think, and it was certainly debated hard in the United States that that there were a lot of people that felt that it wasn't a good agreement. I mean, the fact is, is that it it did provide mechanisms for containing the program, the, the their uh, enrichment program. You know, and and I mean you have to go back and look at you're right, Iran has been looking at building something, they claim, of course, nuclear energy facilities and enrichment facilities for the purposes of of sustaining a nuclear energy program, uh, the, the United States has long held that its its real intent is to build weapons, but it hasn't. And so, you know, so you have to probably wonder a little bit about why hasn't Iran built weapons? That may be a more a more interesting question than how long it has been with doing something with with nuclear materials. Now, the, the J, JPCOA, what it did is it said that. That Iran would agree to to not do highly enriched uranium, and it didn't during the agreement. During the, the span of the agreement, there was no indication that they have, and they still have IEA safeguards in the country. Now we know that that they they have enriched some to to a higher a higher uh, degree, and some claim over twenty percent, which is the the threshold for maintaining a low low enriched uranium versus high enriched uranium. But they haven't really built it to the 90% that's required for weapons grade material. So the agreement was working until you know until uh, uh, Trump came in and and eliminated. It. And of course, you know the Biden administration tried to resurrect it, and and the timing really just wasn't right. It wasn't going to work. Now the Europeans are still part of the agreement, and part of that agreement is that the IE safeguards are still in place. The IEA goes in regularly and looks at what they're doing. Uh, there's, there's of course, accusations that they are getting closer to building a nuclear weapon, and that's that's based on the amount of uh, reprocessing that they've done, and the and the fact that they really can do weapons grade uh, material anytime they want, and but they haven't. And so I think that's why I think the the interesting question here is why haven't they? And my view is that while the United States is worried about it. So is so is Russia. So is China. You know, and I think that that's an important part. Is that while Iran certainly feeds off its relationship with Russia and and China, it also recognizes that Russia and China are a little bit concerned about the idea of Iran going nuclear. Also, so there's there's some I think there's some reservation on the part of Iran, and there may very well be some very direct discussions between Russia and China and Iran about Iran going nuclear, that there is concern in those capitals about Iran's status as a nuclear weapons state also. What effect did the Stuxnet virus that was uh, created by Israel in collaboration with the U.S. a few years ago, uh, and that would be before, I think, before the deal uh, that Barack Obama negotiated? Yeah, uh, Stuxnet, you know, uh, put the uh, cent centrifuges uh, out of control, and and they burned up, and it, it cost uh, 
it cost Iran a lot of time and money to get back to where they were. What about yeah, I mean, that? It, it, How does that affect things? Well, I mean, it, it certainly showed that we had the capacity to to do cyber attacks. And uh, sure, Stuxnet's, I'm sure it, it delayed their program for doing uh, uranium enrichment. You know, I mean, that's what the centrifuges were for. And so by 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 uh, destroying the centrifuges, it certainly delayed any progress that they were making on on uh, enriching more uranium. But it, it it probably didn't really affect a, a weapons program in the sense that it, it there's no direct relationship, given that they've they've been enriching uranium for a long time. And what it did is it prevented them from 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 expanding their enrichment facilities, but it certainly didn't prevent them from developing a nuclear weapon. It, it and I, I don't think it was intended for that. It was really intended to disrupt their capability to enrich uranium. Likewise, uh, you know, Israel, who worries a lot about uh, Iran having a nuclear bomb, um, assassinated uh, one of their nuclear scientists a few years ago. Do you think that had any effect? One scientist, uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't remember the incident, but I'm uh, I, sure. I mean, it does. It, anytime you lose a, a a person on the research team, I think you could say it, it it would. But again, you know, who exactly the person was, I I, I don't know. I don't remember the. I don't remember the news piece that uh, that they had actually assassinated uh, a, a nuclear scientist. If he was mm -hmm. if he was a political actor in that system, or if he was an actual, uh, you know, real technical engineer I, I i just don't so my recollection is is he was a he was a scientist and not a political actor yeah. um and i guess the mission was to try to slow iran down but you know you mentioned that um iran says that it is doing this uh, development um in order as a matter of creating nuclear energy ostensibly for for electrical power mm -hmm. but they have tons of gas and oil um, do they really ever need nuclear for for electrical power? Well, I mean, sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, the U United Arab Emirates has built and is now operating nuclear power plants too. You know, so I mean, it, just because you have just because you have a bunch of oil and gas, I mean, Iran would would answer you, I think, by saying, "Well, we also are concerned about climate change." You know, and so we're we're developing nuclear power to reduce the reliance on on uh, on on fossil fuels. That's that's the argument that the UAE made. It's the argument that the Saudis are making. So you know, I think that that I mean, there's certainly is plausible deniability on the part of Iran to say that that yes, they are pursuing nuclear energy because they realize that you know fossil fuels are are damaging. Yeah, I mean, the same sorts of arguments that everybody else makes for for pursuing nuclear energy. So you know, so I, I mean, I, I think it's not it's not quite fair to to single out Iran, saying you are the ones that are 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 being duplicitous when you say you need to have nuclear energy, because there's others in the region, and and this gets back to my point that I'm trying to make is you know there's there's a whole dynamic in the region about nuclear weapons, about if Iran gets nuclear weapons, then how do you how do you stop the cascade? Because then Saudi Arabia, the, the entire Arab world becomes concerned about, about the fact that, that the Persians in Iran now have nuclear weapons and Israel has nuclear weapons and, and the Arab community is left without. Well, we should get into that, you know, whether we or the other Arab nations uh, can trust Iran. It's a, it's a rogue state. It's responsible in large part for the terrorism in, in, in the region. Um, and uh, I mean, exactly how can you trust a state like that? How can even the state itself trust a state like that? It's like maybe one of the reasons they're holding up or they're slowing it down is because they don't trust themselves. Uh, they don't trust the theocracy. But anyway, I, I want to I ask you about the interaction of this effort and the, the, um, the economy mm -hmm. of Iran. It's expensive to do this. Um, you know, you, you wonder, for example, you know, how and why North Korea builds all these missiles and bombs, what have you. Um, and you wonder also why why Iran would do that. Can they afford it? Are they economically strong enough? 
After all, the sanctions have been imposed on them for quite some time. That has affected their economy. Um, this is It doesn't sound like a practical thing to do. I think you really have to look at it from from Iran's perspective. Can you can if you're Iran, can you afford not to do it? Can you can you afford to 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 put yourself in a position where you become vulnerable to your your perceived enemies? I think. I mean, certainly it has devastated their economy, you know, and I think that that certainly putting sanctions, putting that the sanctions have had a, a very devastating effect. And that's part of the problem that that they're having, and that's why I think you know yesterday at the UN, President Pezerkian actually said you know that he's willing to willing to work with the West to uh, to uh, on the on the nuclear uh, agreement again, you know. So so I think that that the the politicians in in Iran certainly recognize the need to satisfy basic economic needs, and you know and and even though it's Somewhat. Uh, sometimes we forget that while it is a theocracy, it also is a it also is a democracy, you know. And they actually do have elections, and you know, and there is competition for for political seats. Now, granted, you know, the, the Ayatollah Khamenei ultimately controls decisions in the country, political decisions in the country. But there is a there is a political dynamic where where elected officials are trying to satisfy. Uh, the, the the needs and the demands of of the of the citizens. So yeah, I think there's there certainly is is a, a dynamic at play in Iran about how much how much can you afford to develop nuclear weapons, or how much can you afford to sponsor terrorism in the region at the expense of of allowing a a stronger economy. And I think that that's that's the dynamic that that the politicians in Iran certainly face and are are struggling with right now and I th like i said you know this this new president was is is certainly more more uh, open more more liberal if you will than uh, some of the some of the, the past presidents and the theocracy seems to be giving him some some freedom of movement in trying to address uh, the the economic issues and now you know granted you how do you tr how do you trust iran well yeah, that that's always a problem. How do you trust Iran? But I think what what I'm seeing in Iran, you know, is they like a lot of other countries today are taking advantage of the war in the war in Ukraine, the, the shift away from China and the United States, the, the break in relationship with the United States and China, where you know they're gravitating towards this this movement of an alternative rules-based order centered around the BRICS, centered around the, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, centered around the economy that's being built up around U.S. sanctions on Russia and, and Chinese interest in trying to move into, into the so-called global south. In order to evaluate um, the possibilities that they will not only build the bombs, but use the bombs, we should talk about how, how stable they are. Um, we should talk about what motivates them to try to control everything in the region. What motivates them to try to destroy Israel and uh, the Jewish state, the Jewish people, and America? Um, they're they're anti-West, anti-Europe, um, and uh, they're, they're doing this terrorism on a regular and predictable basis. Um, they're a rogue nation. Some people say that um, this whole thing about Bezeskian versus Ali Khomeini, uh, it's good cop, bad cop. And they and they play a little game on the world stage. And Bezeskian goes to the United Nations and seems to be a reasonable individual. But at the end of the day, the theocracy rules. And so, you know, the question is, are they really stable? They have some, they have a terrible agenda. Um, and you can, you know, you can say that this this helps in the in the efforts to undermine the United States and and Israel and Europe and all that. But what you know, what what's in it for them? Um, what motivates them to want to do this? Because they're never going to be a responsible member of the family of nations this way. That's what I was trying to say. Is is what family of nations are we talking about? <laughs>
I mean, no, I mean, but I think this 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 is really the existential crisis of today. Is is what what family of nations are we talking about? You're trying to talk about the West and 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 Israel and and all the all the things that we've grown accustomed to talking about the U.S. led global order. And what I'm trying to talk about is there's this new emerging global order where Iran has a place in that order. And it is a disruptor, and it is a, a, a sort of thorn in the Western flesh. And, and uh, Russia and China don't mind using that proxy. You know, I see them as the old, uh, the center of the old uh, clash of civilizations. I mean, they, they have a, a very vehement, um, uh, what, Shiite population and a Shiite mission, um, as opposed to the Sunnis. Mm -hmm. So you have the the Shiites in the north part of the region and the Sunnis in the south part of the region more accommodating to the Western interests. And um, yes, there's a contention. We have tremendous contentions. But how can you legitimately claim to be a civilized nation if you are fomenting, organizing, funding, and arming terror groups all over the place. Uh, can, can they? Can can anyone, including the other members of the of the BRICS and all that, uh, treat them as responsible, as reliable, as civilized, um, as as anyone would hope they be? And I think my answer to you is yes. I think that that Russia and China see see Iran as stable enough, and and they've they've told Iran. Just like they've told the rest of the world, we're not going to interfere in your inter internal affairs. You you do what you have to do to maintain order within Iran. What we want you to do is to to comply with what we're looking for in the in the global order. And and Iran is doing that in some ways. Like I said, by 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 sponsoring terrorism, by by maintaining some disorder in in the Middle East, it really kind of serves. Russian and and China's interests right now, so you know so so it's not. I mean, you're you're trying to trying to talk about rogues and trying to talk about uh, you know it's a, a system that that disrupts the West, and and I think that that that's that's the the real the real issue is that people don't see that as all bad. The, the people who are working with Iran on this don't see that as all bad, and so I think that that. Yes, if you if you take it from the from the Western liberal liberal world order, it it does look bad. You say, how can you ever expect a country like that to succeed to succeed or to survive? And you're right, you can't. And I think that's what's so frustrating for the United States is what do you do with a country like that where you don't really have control of what happens inside of Iran? You don't really have control of what they're doing in the region. Because they they have other resources, and that's you know, and that's why you know, as you as you the dollar loses influence, as you lose the ability to actually enforce your sanctions, it becomes Im imperative for you to start thinking about how do we deal with these kinds of countries? Because Iran, I think, is probably the classic case of of a country that has survived despite decades of sanctions. And you know, and, and you have North Korea as as the as another example. But North Korea, I think, has been less successful than than Iran in in influencing its its particular region. Well, you know, we had a pretty good deal going uh, with Barack Obama's agreement, and then Trump came in and you know and, and did his bully thing on them. Probably made him really angry. And uh, I mean, as angry as they were in 1979 over how the U.S. was supporting the Shah, I guess the question is, if Trump hadn't done that, where would we be today? And if we had a president that was m more interested in cutting or re resuming some kind of anti-proliferation deal, uh, would Iran really be it really be interested? Uh, in making that deal? Or is this all a charade for them to enhance their power and their weaponry? 
and it's a it's a good question, and I don't think I have an answer to it because it's really hard to tell what what they're up to. I mean, I can I can give you an answer that says, you know, if you're if you're Iran and you're trying to trying to stabilize your society, as you as you suggested earlier, it is it is under pressure to perform to the citizen to the citizens of of Iran. You know, I think that that they would continue to comply with with the the within the parameters of that JPCOA simply because uh they they know that they're limited in what they can do with nuclear weapons vis-a-vis China and Russia and so they would they would use that as to their advantage they would they would try to take advantage of both sides in other words they would if if they could get sanctions i mean so their real motivation in the in the speech yesterday was trying to get the west to rethink the sanctions you know so i think if you're iran you say well if we could get the west to to re, to lift some of those sanctions we actually could do a better job of developing our economy while also taking advantage of of russia and china as they continue to build a, a sort of separate system you know and i think that that so in, in iran's case you know it, it's it's very distasteful for the west to to do that but i you can see how how iran could actually play off the two sides, just like just like the people in Southeast Asia are trying to do, just like to some extent the people in Africa are trying to. The net effect for so many of these options is that the U.S. loses hegemony. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a there's a meeting of the BRICS, which is taking place in Russia somewhere, and um, Iran will be there, and uh, Iran is a you know, uh, I guess a, an esteemed guest at the BRICS conference. And at the BRICS conference, uh, they're going to be talking about a, a change in the reserve currency to gold. I don't know exactly what that means in terms of the strength of the dollar. And we still have a strong economy, but um, that's what they talk about. They talk about trying to undermine the US and the West. And, and then to have that meeting in Russia really says something. I, I mean, Russia, you know, Russia has has done a lot of things in the last six months to very much appear as a normal country where Putin has been out visiting different places, including Vietnam, which of course the United States is still busy trying to uh, trying to to work with as well. You know, so so I see that that Iran is just sort of an extreme case of 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 the, the dilemma that I think the West is starting to face with this with this emerging uh, system that's centered around the the Chinese economy. Yeah. Well, let's assume that, um, you know, that ultimately they are able to build the bomb and they were able to stockpile a a number of nuclear weapons um, and they become uh, a nuclear power. Who knows? They cut a deal with China. They cut a deal with Russia Mm -hmm. um, and they somehow satisfy China and Russia that they're not going to be irresponsible. They're working in tandem in some coordinated foreign relations. But the question I, I, I put to you is, uh, uh, how would that work? How would that change the global calculus to find one day, one Monday morning, that in fact, Iran, considered by a lot of people as a rogue nation, now has the bomb. And presumably, it has the delivery systems. After all, remember, they make missiles, and they're good at it. Um, so the bomb delivery system, it's all connected in my hypothetical. How does that change the calculus for the, the region, for Israel, um, for Europe, for Pakistan and India, for China, ultimately for the U.S.? I mean, well, certainly it affects the region most. I mean, because because the Arabs are the ones that that are are most resistant to the idea of Iran having nuclear weapons, and you know, of course I say the Arabs, but of course also the Israelis. But I, I mean, for the Israelis, it doesn't really change a lot because they're they already are are at odds with with Iran, and and the fact that Iran has a nuclear weapon and Israel has nuclear weapons. You know, then you have to start thinking about the calculus of what are the what is the impact of exploding a nuclear device uh, in your own backyard. Uh, you know, and that that isn't a very very uh, uh, 
a very, very good idea if, if you don't want to be affected by your own nuclear weapon. But I think that the big difference is, is in the Middle East, where, where the Arab countries are then going to start thinking, well, we really need to develop nuclear weapons. And then you get into this, into this hypothetical of, you know, once, once the wall breaks, you know, then everybody moves in. It's the same thing with North Korea and Asia, where, you know, if North Korea is, is successful in maintaining nuclear weapons, now what you see is you see South Korea saying, well, we really need our own nuclear weapons. And Japan thinking, well, maybe I need some nuclear weapons too. You know, and that's why you have this whole argument about the nuclear, the U.S. nuclear umbrella in, in Asia. But in, in the Middle East, you don't have that. You're not going to have the United States going over to Saudi Arabia and, and UAE on Qatar and, and uh, others in the region saying, we'll provide you the nuclear umbrella. And Israel certainly isn't going to do that either. So I would think that that the, the, the immediate impact of a, of a nuclear Iran would be a lot of clamor in the Middle East for an Arab state to develop nuclear weapons. Yeah, including the, you know, the the Sunni, the Sunni states there south of Yeah, Iran. I mean the most the most likely would be Saudi Arabia. They are the ones that see themselves as as the as the real the, the real champion for that for that group of, of countries. So is is a good US policy to arm them? Um would we want to arm the Sunni nations, uh, Saudi Arabia among them? Well, um, no, we want to no. do what they want to do. No, I don't think so. I don't think that would be that would be desirable at all. I mean, you know, like I said, in, in Asia, you know, given given who South Korea and Japan are, that whole idea of a nuclear umbrella works in, in the Middle East. It wouldn't work. And, and certainly we wouldn't want to we would not want to encourage any non-nuclear weapon state to develop nuclear weapons. I mean, that's part of the NPT. And part of the part of the argument that that is the, forms the basis of the non-proliferation treaty. So no, we certainly would not want to be in a position of having to having to entertain the idea of of a a counter to the the Persians having weapons by giving Arabs weapons. You know, and that's why part of the I mean, part of the but again, part of this whole problem in the Middle East is is Israel. You know, because because we we have Israel does have nuclear weapons. You know, as much as the Americans aren't aren't capable of, of saying that publicly, the the fact is is that if Israel does appear to have nuclear weapons, let me take my uh, scenario, my hypothetical further. You know, right now we have a, a an, an an incomplete retaliation. Retaliation for that assassination in Iran of a of a visiting terrorist dignitary. They said they would retaliate, but they haven't actually retaliated yet. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we have we have the uh, the pager incident, uh, the pager attack, which probably Israel, um, and then we have the Israeli attack, which probably coordinated with the the pager uh, attack. And which is going great guns, even as we speak. You're talking about Hezbollah, the attack on Hezbollah in yeah. Lebanon, and, yeah. and and Hezbollah is embedded all through Lebanon. Lebanon is is a Hezbollah state, if you will, sort of like, uh, not exactly, but sort of like Gaza was a, a Hamas state, mm -hmm. and, and and Hezbollah specifically went to Iran and said, "Can you help us? We we need arms. We need." money we need your support in fending off the israeli attack and uh, at the united nations uh, or around the time he spoke at the united nations bezeski had said no no not right now uh, some other time but not right now but israel continues and that seems to be the netanyahu wants to continue that attack and he's and he is um you know not he's ignoring joe biden's efforts to um make peace right now um, and European efforts to make peace right now. And so the attack continues. Well, one of these days we're going to have a retaliation. Who knows what it's going to be like? It's Iran's move. And is Israel could, you know, retaliate against uh, not only Hezbollah, but other proxies, maybe even against uh, Iran. And my question in my my advanced hypothetical here is, 
suppose one of these guys pulls the plug. One of these guys uses, say, tactical nuclear weapons uh, or even a bomb in somebody's city. What happens? Is it How likely is that on both sides of the equation? And what happens? I mean, given that one has nuclear weapons today and the other doesn't, I mean, I would say that it's it's probably not very likely and and the reason it's not likely even even in your in your hypothetical which would have to be a couple of years down the road you don't you don't just one day uh, say i have nuclear weapons and now i'm ready to use them i mean there's there's some there's still some basis of of calculating whether a state has nuclear weapons and is capable of deploying them. so you know so so take your take your scenario out a couple of years i think that at least today, it would be very difficult to 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 do that because you would have so much approbation from everyone by 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 breaking the by breaking the nuclear taboo. You know that that I think it would it would certainly be a calculus that would not be easy to make without a lot of assurances from whoever your real protector is. You know, and so and so, if you're Iran, you would have to have some pretty hard guarantees from Russia or China and China if you were going to do that. And if you were Israel, you'd certainly have to have uh, an America that is prepared to support that sort of activity. And I just I just don't see that happening because because as as part of the part of the P five part of the part of the, the group that under the NPT is authorized to maintain nuclear arsenals it would be very difficult for them to to accept the idea that nuclear weapons are actually used by another party i mean it would it, it would it would break down world order that would affect both both the the existing us-led order and it would break down that order that china is currently trying to create some countries and some leaders don't care they don't care about breaking down the order. They they seem to be heading to chaos, which brings me to my next question. Um, so Israel is uh, under duress. There was an article in the Times today about how the economy of Israel has suffered since October 7th. And um, query how long can they go on when their economy is being undermined by uh, a one or two front war and all these terrorists all around them they're they're so small and and they're peace loving and and but the terrorists persist and you know every time you look there's another attack and so israel is under duress not only on a kinetic basis but on an economic basis okay and and if the united states somehow blows it with israel if if israel loses its power in the region um that changes the calculus a lot so when we look at the election when we look at foreign policy coming out of washington whoever you know is elected we have to take that into account because if israel fails the middle east fails and if the middle east fails the global order fails or at least changes and so my question to you is what can we expect what well, a, what can we expect from uh, a, a a win by uh, Trump or Harris? I'm sure it's different vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Israel and this war in the Middle East. And um, the other question is, what what should we ideally what should we do in terms of foreign policy to to keep things balanced, to keep things under control? to limit the possibility of, of a nuclear war? Those are big questions, and I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer those questions, but I'll try. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, as you were talking, you know, of course, you saw the news like I did, where, you know, um, there's apparently good evidence that Iran has been trying to assassinate uh, certain people, including Donald Trump. And you know his his response was, "Well, you do that, and I'll blow cities to the smithereens." You know, and I think that that's pretty much the the kind of foreign policy actions you can expect from a from a potential Trump administration. 
is a lot of bluster and you know a lot of a lot of big threats. Uh, whether you can deliver those big threats or not, I think is an open question. And so I'll, I'll leave that there and then say, you know, with 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 some if 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 Trump is elected, you would have to hope that there is an administration behind him who can actually develop a, a policy that would have some sense to it. Uh, you know, I think in the if if it becomes a Harris administration, I think you'll see you know a lot of continuation from the Biden administration. Maybe a, I, I would I would anticipate I would hope maybe more as accurately that a by a, a Harris administration would think about how do you how do you work with Iran given given that you're going to have to hold your nose while you do it that there is there is a value in in creating some sort of relationship with iran iran is not going to go away and so if it's not going to go away how can you reduce its worst impulses and try to make it a more responsible country in the region i think that 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 would be my hope is that that's how a, a new administration would look at iran you know they know that given all the past problems we've had given all the history that iran has had you know can can we encourage better behavior is there a way to encourage the citizens of iran to actually act like democrats and actually small democrats and actually force their government into making changes about how they act and how they are perceived in the region so i think that that would be what i would encourage a Harris administration to do, and I guess that gets to to what I'm what what the, the final question that you're asking is, you know, what should we be doing? And I think I think we have to, as much as it's difficult, I think we have to think about how do you how do you try to put Humpty Dumpty back together again in in the aftermath of what uh, of what Netanyahu has done in trying to trying to assert Israel's right to exist. You know, I mean. Okay, we've 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 tried to eliminate Hamas. Now we're trying to eliminate Hezbollah. Now can we can we still find a way to actually get Iran to to contribute something positive to security in the Middle East? I I, I think there is a way. I think I think it can be done. I think that that you know by by working with with the the people in Iran. If you know the people in Iran don't hate America. The, the leadership in Iran hates America. And I think that, that that's the angle that we really need to take, is reminding the politicians in Iran that they actually do have a responsibility to help maintain order in the Middle East and, and find ways for them to actually feel like they're contributing to that security order, rather than trying to, trying to call them rogue, trying to, trying to paint them as, as evil and trying to paint them as, as, as the disruptor. You know, give them give them their opportunity to act as a responsible actor. That would be a beautiful thing. But you're not talking about regime change in Iran, um, because I think in large part the population supports the government, however oppressive and theocratic it may be. Uh, I think what I hear you saying is that they should have influence on the government rather than try to turn it over. What What are your thoughts about that? I think the theocracy is a problem. I, I mean, you know, Khomeini has has been there for a long time now, you know, and and I mean, if if there's a way to reduce his influence or to reduce the theocracy's influence over the politicians, like I said, I mean, Iran does actually have a fairly vibrant democracy. There is actually contestation for within the elections in Iran. So I think, yeah, I think that 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 is that that is the area that seems available for persuasion is is to to not not demand regime change uh, you know the guy says he's liberal you know maybe it is a, a maybe it is a good guy good cop bad cop exhibition but th then let's work with the good cop and find out what his motivations are one last follow-up um, on all of this um you know uh, you meant you referred to the you know the uh, intelligence report that 
uh, Iran maybe trying to assassinate Trump. And that suggests they don't like Trump. Trump was mean to them before. Indeed, he was uh, and would be mean again and blow them up some way. Um, so they don't they don't. I mean, it's I think it's objective. They don't like Trump. Uh, on the other on the other hand, um, the reports have also been that Iran is working with Russia, is working with China to influence the American elections. And I'm not sure where China is. You may know the answer to that. But we do know that Putin um, supports Trump. He thinks that Trump is going to support him in his war against Ukraine. So what I get on this is a disconnect. Russia working with Iran. Russia wants to support Trump. And Iran wants to assassinate Trump. What gives? I don't know. You know, I mean, there's uh, there there is the disconnect. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how much how much these three countries are working together on on the idea of disrupting the elections. It may very well. At my sense is that each one has their own motivations for disrupting the elections. I mean, from from what I can tell, to to, to finish the triad. You know, China really sort of has mixed emotions about who they want in office. They 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 see they see Trump as as being destabilizing just in the sense that he's he's unpredictable. And so I think that, that China would probably prefer a, a, a Harris administration just because they would be predictable and they would be somebody that you could deal with and and feel fairly confident that you're dealing with with rational decision makers. And, and so I think that that they that's probably where they fall. But I, I I don't think I don't think that that there's a lot of coordination between Russia, China, and Iran in their activities in trying to influence US elections. That, that, that's and I have no basis for saying that other than that that's just my sense of what I say. Like I mean you you point out the, the disconnect between what Russia is perceived as wanting versus what Iran is perceived as wanting. I, I just don't think they're, that, that, that their, their, their collaboration is that uh, sophisticated, that they would be able to actually coordinate something like that uh, amongst the three of them. It's not, it's not an, I, I don't want to paint them as an axis of evil in the sense that they are actively trying to, trying to manipulate the U.S. election. I just don't think that, that that's the case. Well, perhaps they're all trying to manipulate it differently. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. I think I think I I, I don't doubt that the the reports that they they are trying to manipulate it are accurate. I just don't think that they're actually coordinating their their activity together. And in some ways, it doesn't matter because it becomes very disruptive, regardless of how they're doing it and what they. You know, all this all this Carl points out to the importance of the inflection point, the global inflection point uh, on and maybe shortly after November 5th. Um, and uh, I would really like to follow up with you on how that will work. We'll know more. We may we may see more emerging before November 5th, but certainly after. Anyway, Carl, thank you so much for this discussion. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Thanks to our viewers for watching. Aloha.